child of God. Then God has a divine assignment for your life. Uh, when you understand that you are on assignment for God, you'll find that you're always moving towards a divine destination. Notice I said moving towards a divine destination. Not moving towards the destination that you have planned out and mapped out for your life. Rather, we are talking about the destination and the destiny that God has for your life. Now, don't think that because your name is child of God and that God has a plan for your life, that your life is going to always work out smooth. No, you're going to have to deal with the pressures and with some setbacks as well as some setups. Because life has something called destination blockers. Uh, these destination blockers have a way of causing life to switch on you. In other words, everything can be going just fine. And all of a sudden, everything in your life changes. How many of you know this morning that I'm right? The things can be going fine in the morning. But before the sun goes down, your, your life can be turned up side down. Now, just in case there's anybody in the house that does not believe that life can switch on you, if you just keep on living, sooner or later, something is going to come up in your life that will make you hard. At some point, your mornings will be turned into midnights. Your laughter is going to be put on later way. Your smile will be subverted by sorrow. I tell you, life can switch on you without even giving you a moment's notice. As a result of life switching on us, we are oftentimes forced to wrestle with issues and demons uh, that are trying to hinder us from reaching our divine destination in God. Uh, the tension of wrestling with our movements towards where God wants us to go. And wrestling against the forces that are trying to end our movements are sometimes so strong that they can force us to the edge of insanity. Uh, therefore, sometimes we forget who we are and whom we belong to. Uh, we often feel because we are children of God that we are going to be exempt from the pain, the suffering, and the setbacks that life has for us. Uh, I don't know, maybe you don't want to admit it, but I know for myself that when I'm going through, I often have a talk with God. Uh, I, I tell God things like, oh God, my weeping has already endured for too many nights, and now God, it's time for you to give me some joy in the morning. But oh God, and telling me, I know what you're going through, but I'm not ready to deliver you out of it just yet. I wonder, is there anybody in the house besides myself that has been ready for God to deliver you out of your situation, and God left you there for a little while longer? But I tell you, God has a word. God has a word for the children of Israel. In that word, we will also find a message for us today. A word came to Israel in the wilderness of the Sinai Desert 40 years before they entered the land of promise. Yes. And about 300 years after they left Egypt. The word essentially was and is, do not forget your heritage. Don't forget where God has brought you from. Don't forget the journey that you have traveled that got you where you are in the present moment. No matter what that moment is in the present. No matter if the moment is good, no matter if the moment is 
not so good, don't forget the God that has brought you where you are. This morning, as we look at and examine this particular passage of scripture in the Gospel of Mark, the writer of this text points out that Jesus is, so, is not so removed from the social and the cultural elements of the everyday life of his people. In fact, it is because he is one of them that Jesus remembers not to forget. And Jesus can take the time to remember not to forget. How much more should you and I be intentional on not forgetting who got us where we are and how we got to where we are? See, some of us can remember how to remember who brought us where we are. But some of us have had uh, conveniently have had amnesia. <laughs> and we have forgotten the road that we walked to get to where we are. Because sometimes the road was not always a boundary road. The road was not always a road that made you look good. The road is a road that is filled with shortcomings. A road that is filled with mistakes. A road that is filled with depression. A road that is filled with poverty. And sometimes we reach a place where we want to forget the road. But God sent me up in here this morning to tell you, don't forget the road that you shot. Because the road that you child has helped to make you who you are. If you're a strong, almighty woman in God, it's not because you just woke up that way. It's because of the role that you child before today to get you from where you used to be to where you are on today. And the only reason that you can praise God from where you used to be to where you are is because God looked beyond your voice. along with his disciples are traveling along their divine assignment. Jesus is now on his way to the cross to die for your sins and for mine. For you see the cross on the hill called Calvary was Jesus's earth, ultimate earthly destination. But before he reached Calvary he had to make two stops on the way. A one was a stop at a table, and the other was a stop in the dark. Jesus is teaching us that in order for us to reach the ultimate destination, that there may be some pit stops or some layovers that we are going to encounter on the way. Yeah. Uh, the pit stops or the layovers in our lives can be those moments or those seasons of frustration as well as disappointment. Mm -hmm. Many that are here this morning are in a pit stop or a season of layover. Mm -hmm. For you see, the layover or the pit stop that you're in, whether we know it or not, are needed moments of frustration that will help you reach your destination. You see, it's here in the moment of frustration where God is able to strengthen and renew you so you can finish the journey. You see, Jesus, along with the disciples, are moving towards the table. Now, moving towards the table means that there is a movement in the direction of a divine destination. But they have to get to the table first. Because it's at the table where the needed elements are a needed necessity to complete the journey. Now we must know that the elements at the table are not needed by Jesus. Jesus doesn't need what's at the table to complete his journey. Abba, what's at the table is needed for the disciples to complete their journey after Jesus lives, leaves them. But the fact of the matter is that Jesus does not need the elements because Jesus is the elements at the table. You see, we 
talk about the table, but the table is really symbolic. The table stands for the core concerns of life itself. It represents the divine intention and the divine intervention that comes from God. It is at the table where the children of God are able to experience and are able to receive the fundamental elements of divine love that comes from God. At the table, like at the cross, God gives of himself because God is love, and love can do no less than give all of itself to those in which love loves. Amen. You know, being at the table is one thing, but making it to the table is something else altogether. In order for Jesus and the disciples to have made it to the table, or they have to overcome some hard trials and tribulations. It was not like they just got up and said, we're going to go and have this feast of the Passover. We're going to go this morning and have communion. But Jesus and the disciples, as they traveled towards the table, had to deal with much opposition. You see, traveling or making your way to the table is a journey of faith. It takes faith to continue along your destination. And when every time you turn around, there's something trying to prevent you from reaching your journey. Yeah. This is a word of encouragement for someone this morning. The fact that you have made it back from last week to this week. The fact that you were able to make it to the table this morning after you left the table last week. Yeah. It's a sign that God has been blessing you. Yeah. You see, last week the forces of this world were designed and they were trying to keep you from reaching the table this week. Because whenever you get to the table, you are in the presence of Jesus Christ. And that's what the enemy always wants to prevent you from getting back to the table because the enemy understands there's power at the table. There's joy at the table. At the table, there's peace. At the table, there's joy. But do you know why Jesus wants us to get to the table? Because the fact of the matter is that Jesus is the table. Well, let me break it down. Uh, 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 we need to understand that in the New Testament scriptures, there never was a table. You don't find a table in the scripture that never was a table. For you see, the traditional Hebrew meal of the feast of the Passover was the gathering in a circle around what was called a common bowl. And the reason that we talk about the table is because Jesus is the apparatus that holds everything up and everything together. It's Jesus right now that's holding you up and that's holding you together. With everything that's going wrong in your life, with everything that's trying to break you down in your life, Jesus is holding it together. Why do you think the sisters didn't take you out of here? Because Jesus was holding you up. Why do you think that the death of the loved one didn't make you lose your mind? Why? Because Jesus has been holding you up. Or why do you say when you lost your job and everybody laughed at you and everybody thought you was going down for the last time but you never missed your rent, you never missed your phone bill, you never saw it. So these disciples understood. 
God is Jesus going to overlook the Passover. And now you have to understand what the Passover is all about. Here in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus holds up a memorial that God set up back in the book of Exodus 12, verse 14. And the text says, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. What the text was referring to was the tactical maneuvers God used to break the strongholds that the Egyptians had over the children of God. In other words, this is the time when God set free the children of Israel from slavery, from the hands of Pharaoh. God sent a death angel into Egypt and killed the firstborn Egyptian male of every household that was not under the blood of the land. Now what happened was this. On the night that the death angel was going to come through and arrive, the children of Israel were to take a lamb that was enough for their household. And if by chance their household was too large for the lamb or too small for the lamb, they would come together as neighbors and they would share in the Passover meal. That this had to be not any kind of lamb, but it had to be a special lamb. The lamb had to be without blemish. The lamb had to be a male lamb of one year old. You shall keep this lamb until the 14th day of the month and you shall kill it in the evening. In other words, all over the land of Egypt, the children of Israel who were in bondage were killing a male one year old lamb without spot or without a blemish. And one of the things I've asked myself, why is it that God required the children of Israel to kill the lamb? Couldn't God just have given them what God wanted them to have? And the answer is yes. But what I have found out is that every now and then God wants us to participate in our own deliverance so that we can be set free. God does not always want to just deliver you by yourself, but God wants you to participate in the deliverance for your life. And if God wanted them to participate in their deliverance, God wants you to participate in your deliverance today. Whatever it is that's holding you captive, that's holding you back, we can pray to God all we want to. God, I need you to deliver me from this, God. I need you to do that in my life. But I'll stop by to tell you on today that you are not putting in the work to get delivered. Deliverance is not going to happen. Are you trying to tell me God's not going to deliver me? That's exactly what I'm trying to say. Sometimes you have to do some work. Here I am, an alcoholic. And I want God to deliver me. And I pray for deliverance. But every day I make my way to the liquor store. There has to be something different in my life. If, if I can't resist going to the liquor store, I need to get hooked up with a friend that will walk with me past the liquor store and won't let me go in, but I have to work on this problem, not just that God do, but I got to do it for myself. There's no need for you to talk about I need a new job and you don't ever feel I have no applications. You don't ever do the things that to get the job. Nah, you're going to have to do some things for yourself. Yeah. I, I know God has called me to be a mighty man, a mighty woman in God. And if for some reason I just can't do it well, because you watch too much television. Amen. If you want to do what God has called you to do, if you want to get what God has called you to be spiritually, you got to get up early in the morning. And you got to read your Bible. You have to develop a prayer life. You have to learn how to meditate before the Lord so that God can do something in you so that God can do something for you. And then God can do something through you. Many of us want God to do something through us. And God has not done anything in us. God will never do anything through you until God does something in you. Yeah. And so these Egyptian children were in bondage and they were participating in their own freedom. And after the lamb was killed, they were to roast the lamb. The lamb was to be eaten with bitter herbs. And the Lord told 
told them on that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. And will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both male and beast. And against all gods of, the Egypt, of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So here, Jesus is remembering the covenant that God made with the children of God. So in the Gospel of Mark, this Last Supper or the Eucharist or the communion that we call it is actually a, a interventional meaning. It expresses the convictions that God had invaded the past and it encourages hope that God will interrupt the future. Yeah. So as Jesus travels towards the table, he reminds the children of God of their past, while simultaneously giving them hope for the future. Mm -hmm. The children of God were like so many of us, yeah. in that they were an occupied people. Yeah. Their present situation was not something that they controlled with their own devices, but they were controlled by the Roman government. Yeah. But as they looked behind them in history, they could cherish and shout at the memories of the divine orchestrated move of God towards liberation. Yeah. Cutting through the boundaries that separated the natural from the supernatural. The divine from the mortal. Their God and our God claimed their ancestors and our ancestors and gave them a new lease on life. Yeah. On behalf of God, God now around Pharaoh's Egypt. And from a people who had been enslaved, God's action set them free and carved out a new nation of believers and established a covenantal relationship with them. In other words, God says, I'll make a blood agreement with you. I'll be your God and the only thing you have to do is be my people. And I believe that covenant still is in effect today. That God says, if we will be his God, and that he will be our God, and we will be his people. Yes. Those of us who are descendants of an enslaved people must therefore make our way towards the table. Yes. And no matter what the cost or the price that we must pay, not only are we descendants of slaves, but all of us that presently know Jesus as Savior, whether you want to admit it or not, you were once slaves to sin. Yes. Therefore, we need to press our way towards the table and remember collectively as a people where God has brought us from. Yes. We need to remember not to forget the struggles that we've had to face. Remember not to forget the hard trials and the tribulations that God has brought us through. Yes. And as individuals, we need to remember not to forget how we lived before Christ came into our lives. Yes. Before Christ came into our lives, our lives should be a whole lot different now after Christ yeah. than it was prior to Christ. So yeah. We need to remember not to forget that before Jesus came into our lives, our lives was towed up from the flow up. Before yeah. Jesus came into our lives, some of us would do anything with anybody. Before yeah. Jesus came into our lives, alcohol, drugs, lying, and deceit, and whatever else came to our mind was our normal way of living. Yeah. But now that we have Jesus in our lives, we can look back and say, the Lord has brought me a mighty long way. Yeah. I wonder, is there anybody in the house today that's not a strange thing we feel, and that we can look back over your life and before Jesus came in your life, your life was tore up from the floor. But now Jesus came in your life. You say, look what the Lord has done. And that's what 
God has done some things. God has done some things in the past. And in the indication of what God is going to do in the future. No matter how horrific our present day situation is. If I can look at what God has done in my life in the past. I may not know what he can do in the future. But if what he has already done is any indication of what he can do or what God will do, no matter how bad my situation is, when I think about where he has brought me from and think about where God can take me, I can praise my God right in the midst of the hell that I'm going through. Why? Because I know that God brought me from that that God can take me from here to where God
pitcher of water. Yeah. Jesus is teaching us in the text that the demands of discipleship <laughs> takes on a new meaning as we move towards the table. Yeah. As we move towards the table, it demands obedient discipleship based on previous arrangements that we don't know anything about. In other words, God has a plan of provision that God has not told us about, that God will not tell us about, until God gets ready to reveal it to us. The arrangements of the meal was already made. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see where Jesus emailed, text anyone, or where Jesus posted on Facebook that he was coming to town to have the Passover meal. But when he got there, the provisions were already made. In other words, Jesus had other people that were not with him, that were preparing for him. You got to get this. God has people that are not with you. Turn left and then go four steps and turn right. And then you say, Lord, I already. 
invitation to make Jesus your choice. If there is one this morning that does not know Jesus in the parting of the sins, and the Holy Spirit is leading you to accept Jesus as Savior, we say, Come. Why you still have time? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The second appeal. If there's one this morning who has a relationship with the Lord, yes. but now you are in the state of being a backslider, yes. I need you to remind you that God is married yes. to the backslider. Yes. Yes. And he is just saying to you, yes. come back home. He is saying to you that I desire to have intimate, personal, up close relationship. Yes. 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 Third feeling is if there's a person that has accepted Christ as Savior and you are desiring to make the Soul Park for United Christian Church your church home. Yes. And if the Holy Spirit is leading you, you say, Come here yes. while you still have time. At this time, we now have our altar call. If anyone desires prayer, I have to 